Welcome to the Teaching Journeys podcast, hosted by Dave Roberts. Humanity possesses a unique skill, the ability to pass knowledge from one generation uh, to the next. This podcast embraces that ability, offering learning opportunities through conversations with extraordinary guests. Dave aims to leave a positive mark on individuals around the world. So before you dive into today's episode, please share this podcast with your network, including friends, family, and colleagues. And please consider leaving a rating or review. Your support makes all the difference. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Teaching Journeys podcast. I'm your host, Dave Roberts. And today, it is my pleasure to have as my guest, Ashley Moody and Nick Unst. Ashley Moody received her bachelor's degree in medical technology from Upstate Medical Center and continued on to graduate from the New York Chiropractic College with her doctorate in chiropractic. During her clinical rotations, Ashley was hand-selected from a group of her peers to serve as a student remote chiropractic clerk at the Rochester, New York VA Hospital. She went on to finish her clinical rotations as the first ever selected chiropractic extern at the Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania VA. Dr. Moody enjoys being outdoors with friends and family. She enjoys various types of exercise, including yoga, hiking, strength training, CrossFit, and running. Nick Ungst received his Bachelor of Science degree in exercise physiology in 2009 from the Indiana University of Pennsylvania. Following graduation, he was a full-time personal trainer and a corporate health and wellness advisor in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. It was at this time that Dr. Ungst found a true passion for health, wellness, and helping others achieve their goals. Dr. Unst is also the developer of the Check Yourself Mobility and Function Seminar Series, previously provided and instructed to to sports teams and running groups. In his free time, Nick enjoys different types of exercise, including strength training, CrossFit, and running and cycling. He has completed the Pittsburgh Marathon and numerous triathlons in western Pennsylvania. He also enjoys hiking, fishing, strong coffee, a man close to my heart, and working within his community. And Nick, I will tell you that I finished the Pittsburgh Marathon in my dreams. Did it? How'd it go? I actually finished first, <laughs> which would tell you it was a dream. You did well. Um, oh. And, and uh, Ashley, I will tell you, I know you do a lot with yoga. And one of the first, the first things that I told Nick when he asked me about my flexibility was I said, basically, I have the flexibility of a two by four. And he put that. In my case, it's my case notes. In quotes, in quotes yeah. In, in quotes. Um, I, I hope, hopefully, the insurance company didn't question your clinical judgment on that one. So, if, if they match me, they wouldn't. The, the, that's probably very true. Before we get into, we're not going to be talking about chiropractic and medicine. We're going to be talking with Nick and Ashley about a life-altering event that occurred in 2022. Um, that literally. And I could, and I'm assuming this changed the landscape of their lives. We're going to talk about the event and, and, and how it did so. But before I do that, um, they are the co-owners of Klein Chiropractic, which is located on 421 Broad Street in Utica, New York. Um, I have the pleasure of being a client of Klein Chiropractic, and I'm just going to say this. I never thought I would have so much fun getting my back aligned. Um, <laughs> Ashley and Nick creates just such a welcoming, warm family atmosphere. It's just like you come in and you're part of family. And, um, if you're in the Utica area or, or in the greater Utica area, check out their services. They're great people. They're very competent. They're very skilled and they create a really safe family like atmosphere for anybody that, uh, has the privilege of crossing paths with them. So I just wanted to say that before we get into the, um, uh, get into the uh, crux of our conversation. Thank you, Dave. We appreciate it so much. And we, like I always say, we enjoy having you as much as we break your chops. We like having you around. (laughs) He's just trying to get that espresso bar. Uh (laughs) Hey, I'd be happy with the back seats. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> it, it may be a Mr. Coffee machine. How's that? <laughs> up in a mezzanine somewhere. Oh, you know. Up in the, in a literal box, the exercise box. <laughs> I'd be happy with that. Oh, jeez. Oh, I have so much fun doing this. Yeah, you have to, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's, it's, a, it's a blast. It's a blast. So I'm going to ask both of you, tell our listeners about the experience that shaped your life path. Yeah. Um. So on May, it was 24th. It was a Tuesday. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was like any other day I got up. So at this time, I was 19 weeks pregnant, uh, my first pregnancy. And got up, did my normal workout. I remember I went for, I did like little, you know, 400 meter runs um, and some weight training and went to work, worked all day. Um, and during the day, there were a couple times where I thought I felt the baby move. And um, it was not what people describe it as. Um, the first time I felt this was the Sunday before. So um, on Sunday, Nick and I were sitting on the couch together. I said, oh, my God, I think I just felt the baby move. Um, and I told him, I said, it felt like this. And he and I said, it didn't feel like butterflies or gas bubbles. I was like, it didn't hurt, but it wasn't comfortable. Um, and then I remember feeling it once on Monday. And then I remember feeling it, I think, one or two times on Tuesday while I was at work. Um, no pain, no issues, nothing like that. Um, we got home. We ate dinner. And after dinner, a little while, we're getting into bed. And I said, I don't feel very good. Like, my stomach's kind of feels a little off. Like, I think I'm going to be sick. I wonder if, you know, maybe our burgers were, you know, great. And um, I remember you saying, too, you were like, yeah, hey, my stomach kind of doesn't feel that that great either. So I was like, oh, great. We're, you know, we're going to get some food poisoning or sick or something. Um, and a little while later, it kind of got worse. So I, I got up, went to go to the bathroom and just, you know, when you think you're going to get sick, you sit there and wait to see what happens. And um, nothing happened, nothing happened, but the pain kept getting worse. Um, and then I did have a bowel movement and the pain got worse. And I was in the bathroom. I remember being on all fours, just kind of like, what is going on? And just kind of, you know, my clinical brain kind of clicked on, like running an assessment, like this just feels different. This doesn't feel like gastroenteritis, like um, you know, this doesn't feel like what I would imagine a miscarriage to feel like. Um, and so I, I went to get up and I couldn't stand up. Um, I like any opening of my abdomen just was excruciating. And I remember kind of just being there for a little bit with it. Like, okay, I have to get Nick now. Like this, something's happening. Um, so I crawled to the bedroom and I had to kind of pull myself up on the side of the bed and wake Nick up. And I just woke you up saying, like, we have to go to the hospital, like something's wrong. And, you know, he got me dressed and because I couldn't do anything for myself. And I don't remember. Did you have to carry me down the stairs or was I able to walk? You were able to kind of crawl down the stairs. Okay. And um, so we headed towards the hospital and I did actually end up um, puking in the car. And I said, oh. You know what? I feel a little bit better. I don't feel like I have to go anymore. <laughs> and Nick's like, no, I think we're still going to go. <laughs> so, I don't think that. <laughs> so um, we got to a local hospital. Um, and I will say it was not a very good experience. Uh, we were there about 13, 12, 12, 13 hours, 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 somewhere in that um, range. With very minimal assistance, um, no information. Uh, and I was in a lot of pain. Um, I remember being, I remember just being on the bed in the little cubby and just rolling around. Like I remember laying on my side, going into a quadruped position, laying on my, like just trying to find any position of relief. Um, and there was nothing. And I just remember kept, I kept saying to Nick, like, you need to get them. You need to get them. They have to do something. I like, I'm in pain. Like, and I have a pretty high pain tolerance. And, and that was one of the things Nick was saying, they're not taking you seriously. Because when they were asking me my pain scale, I was like, it's a seven, it's a seven. <laughs> you know? And, but to me, it was a seven because everyone has a different pain scale. Like eight would be like, I can't move. Nine is I can no longer talk. 10 is I'm literally dying. So it's, um, mm -hmm. uh, they ended up doing an MRI and 
they came in around 7 a.m. and they said, you know, what it, it looks like your colon is flipped, but because we can't do a CT because you're pregnant, it's not a great image. Um, and fortunately, I was pregnant, so they sent me out um, and they referred me to Albany Medical. And when I got to Albany, which the transfer to Albany was awful um, at this point in time, every single bump like so if you're looking at a road and you see just that little thin line that seam every bump was just an excruciating pain in my abdomen um and we finally got to albany and they they wheeled me into the er there and i mean we were swarmed with doctors um and you know at that point in time we had no answers um the doctors had told us they couldn't see anything in the images that were sent over from the local hospital and then essentially they would have to open me completely up and see what they found because they didn't know and there was no time to do any other imaging they couldn't wait any longer um and so for us at that time it was obviously a little scary we didn't know what was going on we didn't know if it was something with me something with the baby um and then that's where Albany had me start signing forms of you know, releasing, you know, if anything happened to the baby, releasing them of, you know, responsibility for that. So that was a weird thing to be signing. Um, um, from there, we, you know, went in, we had surgery. And what they had found was my intestines had actually started to twist. So um, my small intestines twisted on themselves. And I was born with an extra long colon. And so what they kind of described to us was my colon had flaw. And then after what they suspect was after I started to digest dinner, um, it kind of almost like the peristalsis created this vacuum effect that pulled the intestines, small intestines through the loop and the clock and tightened everything off. And so that immediate onset of pain that I experienced was the start of my small intestines dying. Um, so we had one surgery Wednesday morning, um, I had gone septic and I believe they had to stabilize me, I think twice, they said. So they took me out of surgery. Um, they left me intubated, open, um, but I was awake and I remember coming out of the surgery and I just remember my mom and Nick being there. I remember seeing a tube like coming out of my mouth like in vision and I couldn't talk and I was restrained so my my hands were tied down and I remember like trying to communicate with Nick with my eyes like I remember like trying to squint at him like what is going on you know and um I wanted to see what was happening so um you know so he took a picture and showed me so I could see and then explained what had happened and what was going on and what they were doing and I remember him I remember like trying to move my arms going like mm, like why can't I move my arm and he's like they don't want you to pull up the tubes and I just remember like kind of rolling my eyes like I wouldn't do that um, and uh they brought me a whiteboard because I was I was not going down. I apparently had things that I wanted to say. And when you hear what they were, they, they're interesting. They weren't exactly important, but they were to me at the time. Um, but uh, so they loosened one of my hands so I could write on a whiteboard. And it was kind of a guessing game of what I was saying. So my mom and Nick were like guessing because at first I guess I was drawing on your guys' hands. Like, so I was writing letters mm -hmm. on their hands. Um, and one of the things I wrote was brain. So I was like, not happy they turned my brain off. Apparently that was very upsetting to me. Um, my type A personality really kicked in. And, uh, then it was, um, cancel my oil change. I had an oil change for Thursday. Thursday. <laughs> um, let our friends know that we wouldn't be making it to MERS because we had a time reserved and I wanted to open that time if other people mm -hmm. wanted that slot. And cancel dinner reservations with Andy and Danielle for Friday. And uh, and then, is there anything else I had to say that was like... <laughs> um, but then from there, they took me in for my second surgery on Thursday. And um, we did okay. I came out of surgery. 
um, we still did not know anything about the baby. So from Tuesday night until Thursday coming out, we had no idea what was going on. On Friday, they did bring somebody in, and that was when we were going to find out if our baby survived. And they had a really hard time finding a heartbeat. So I was, you know, kind of laying on the bed as they're searching, searching, searching. It was a couple minutes of them, like, kind of looking, and nothing was happening. And, you know, Nick wouldn't make eye contact with me. My mom wouldn't make eye contact with me. They're both just staring at the ceiling. And then all of a sudden, I remember just hearing that. And it was a it was a big celebration. The the baby made it through and I think surprised everybody. Mm -hmm. So we got very lucky. I survived, the baby survived. And then our um, you know, healing journey began. We had to, you know, start from scratch. I uh we got home what a week later. Like a week and a half, two so weeks we later, yeah. yeah. Um I got to come home and that was where the healing process began the physical the mental um for me it was a challenge of being the person that i am being such a healthy strong person too i couldn't get out of a chair by myself i couldn't make i couldn't pick a pan up to make myself breakfast um i had no core strength whatsoever um and then there was the factors and changes of continuing a pregnancy so i was my incision is from rib cage down to pubic bone. So my entire abdomen had been um, opened. And, you know, as you're growing and trying to heal at the same time, it was a very odd sensation. You could feel as you were starting, as my belly was starting to grow, as the baby was growing, you could feel just, it was this burning, like tearing mm -hmm. sensation all along my abdomen. Um, and it was, I, it was awful. It was like the worst feeling because it was, it's a good sign because now that I'm lacking seven feet of intestine, um, you know, am I absorbing enough to support my life? Am I absorbing mm -hmm. enough to support the baby's life? But, you know, at that time, the baby's going to pull what it needs to from you. So the baby will grow. Um, but it was, it was just a very uncomfortable, but oddly reassuring at the same time that the baby was okay. Um, but then there was the point, the factors too for me that that was really hard was feeling the baby move because for me originally when I thought I was feeling the baby move that twist sensation I was feeling um, the doctors think that was my intestines um, so when I started to really feel the baby moving it was very startling for me and it was it was hard. Um, there was a lot of a lot of tears of fear um and just having to be okay with crying <laughs> and like <clears throat> and knowing like okay just breathe it's not the same feeling like you can really feel the baby moving they, they told you it won't happen again like everything's okay so it was a lot of self-talk um but we, you know, we we did it. I gained weight through the, the rest of my pregnancy. I started to gain muscle mass through the rest of my pregnancy. Um, and, you know, but that was my focus was getting healthy and getting strong again, because in my mind, I wasn't done. Like we still had to get, we had 21 weeks where we had to finish this pregnancy and deliver and get both of us safely through delivery. I personally was determined to not have a cesarean because I did not want another abdominal surgery and birth was a whole nother thing but we got very lucky in the end you know there were a few hiccups um in our delivery story but we you know we were fortunate and I did have a vaginal delivery and our son is here his name is Charlie and he's fantastic and he's healthy and he's strong and he's brilliant and he does not seem affected by his journey into the world at all, which is incredible. Um, and that's our that's our life altering story. <laughs> that's quite a life altering story. Yeah. You could see, you know, after the surgery when you felt him move, that had a whole different meaning based on past experience. And mm -hmm. you know, that's one of the things is from my observation, when something like that happens, the safety net is now forever 
forever altered. Um, yeah. There's no guarantee. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, 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 I've got to ask you, Nick, from watching her Ashley go through this, what were your thoughts and feelings as you were witnessing Ashley's health challenges with, with Charlie? Yeah. Um, you know, it's a really interesting to look back on and evaluate it now, you know, cause I know at the point in time, there was just a lot of shock and stress. And, um, I remember being oddly composed. I remember like being, being okay. Like we got to take this step next and this step next until I wasn't, you know, and, and it, it was the, uh, you know, handle the situation, handle the thing in front of you. Um, and then the evaluation and reflection afterwards is completely different. You know, I know that when I was sitting in the waiting room, so this was during her first operation, um, sitting Albany Medical Center, I've been sitting in the waiting room for probably two, two and a half hours, and we still didn't really have any answers or, or anything yet on what was even happening outside of an intestinal pathology going on. I had the chance to reflect a little bit and I had thought back to just the day prior and um, just how fast things changed and how they can change. And we had went to bed that night and all happened. We went to bed around nine 30, like we normally do. Um, and I remember waking up and hearing her screaming, uh, something is wrong. Get out of bed at exactly 10, 14 or the exact time. Cause I shot out of bed. And the first thing I saw beside my head was the clock. So in 44 minutes, roughly, you know, life changed that fast. So, and then trying to, you know, understand what the doctors are saying. I was very fortunate for our training at this point in time too, because the surgeon to his credit, um, he was incredible. His communication with us was incredible on what was actually happening, what they had to do, what they thought the possible outcomes would be. And they gave me a, a range of outcomes from the, you know, the most catastrophic being the obvious that we would lose both of them to the, the best case scenario, they would make it out. They assumed that she would have way more complications coming out of the operation than she did. Uh, I'll never forget the image that she talked about, of, you know, running into the, the ICU room in between the two operations and, and finding her laying on the bed, uh, just, you know, and then saw it open Dave from the sternum to the pubic bone, probably a 12 to 14 inch incision and just gauze and iodine and intestinal matter and tubes coming out of every orifice you could possibly find. And that's when it really hit home to me. Like, wow, this changed so fast from where we were yesterday, just a brief 24 hours ago. So it was a lot of shock and it was, um, you know, I, uh, they had a little waiting room screen in the uh, Albany Medical Center hospital room in the surgical center that would just say where the pre- the patient was at in their surgical operation and everyone had a number assigned to them. And it would just uh, green if they were in operation, red if they were out of operation. So I just stared at the screen for three hours and just waited till it turned <laughs> red. <laughs> uh, you know, that was really about where I was at that point in time. Um, luckily for me at that point in time, her parents had had met us in Albany and, and joined me at least. So I wasn't sitting there alone any longer, but it was, you know, obviously stressful. And you had the call too. When you yeah, out. yeah. So yeah, I guess that's a good point. So the, we had, so like, like she had talked about from that night, we spent the whole night in the hospital in Utica and then we ended up in Albany. And once they took her in for surgery, um, I was sitting beside her dad and, you know, we hadn't slept all night or anything like that. And. She just went in and he said, you know, let's go upstairs to the cafeteria. Well, let's get some coffee and a sandwich or something like that. You haven't eaten anything in, you know, 14, 15 hours. You haven't drank any water. I'm still in my pajamas at that point in time, mind you. <laughs> so we go upstairs and we're in the hospital cafeteria line. And I, was, I had a cup of coffee in my hand and we we're getting a sandwich around. And all of a sudden my cell phone rings and uh, it was Albany number. So I looked down and it was Albany, and this is probably important pick it up. And, uh, there's a woman on the other line and she says, hi, is this Nick? And I said, yeah, she goes, hold please. And then the line goes completely blank for 20 seconds and her dad's sitting there staring at me and I'm on the phone. And uh, all of a sudden the, the surgeon picks up on the other line of the phone and he says, hi, Nick. And I said, yes. And he says, uh, hi, this is Dr. Nigam. I'm, I'm, I'm doing surgery on your wife right now is how he introduced himself. And I said, I'm well aware of who you are, sir. <laughs> um, he goes on to explain the pathology and, um, gave me the options right then and there and said, basically what they were going to have to do was they were going to have to take one end of her small intestine, cut it here, take the other end, cut it here, remove roughly seven feet of small intestinal matter that had died. 
Um, and they knew that she was going to go into sepsis and that was a, a chance they were willing to take and be prepared for. Um, that was not a good option for the baby, but at that point in time on the phone, he expressed to me that we are no longer going to be monitoring the baby. We are simply trying to save your life at this point in time. So he said, I'm going to do what I got to do. Um, meet me in the waiting room as soon and, and be there as soon as you possibly can. So. I run out, I like threw cash at the person who was working the register of cafeteria and ran downstairs. And that's when I sat there and I watched that screen for the next three hours and just not knowing what's going to happen. It was, yeah, it was tough. I wanted to ask you another question too. Did at any time, Nick, did you feel powerless at all what, to watching Ashley go through what she was going through? I would say the, the entire time I felt powerless, David, to be honest with you, you know, I, um, uh, at least powerless for the the major situation. I know that I, I could hold power over how I composed myself and try to make the right decisions and um, communication. I held power over that still, but I knew ultimately it was out of my hands, you know, and mm -hmm. I'm a person who's usually pretty under control in most situations. Like I usually have a pretty steady, firm grip on what's going to happen, what I can do about it and how I can change or control it, you know, and, and that's something I've practiced for years and I've gotten better at, which is good, but this situation was completely different. So it was uh, a different, almost like alternate reality for me at that point in time. And, and Nick's personality, which you, which you know, cause you know him, he's a caretaker. That's his nature yes, is, yes, he is he wears his heart on his sleeve and he loves so strongly and cares so strongly for those around him. And for him, like in life in general, like he's like, how can I make things, you know, how can I help you in this situation? How can we make this? Like, he's very good about all of those things. It's a curse, Dave. It's a curse. It can't be. Um, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful treat. But for him, it's a lot to bear when he's trying to, you know, help others versus, you know, kind of help himself at times. And I know for me at the time, like, I just remember like my body telling me void, 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 void. And I was like, Nick, I need the bedpan. Nick, I need the bedpan again. Like, and so this poor guy is gloving up, just handing me a bedpan for nothing to come out. Cause at that point there's, there's nothing there, but my body is telling me void. And like, so for you, you were at least able to maybe help. Yeah, and I like did. he supported in the ways that he could too. You're right. Nick is the ultimate caretaker and you're right. It can be a curse mm -hmm. because, because of that, we feel yeah. so intensely. Mm -hmm. And then we grieve and we our, our sadness intensifies as a result of that. But that makes Nick who he is. And mm -hmm. um, you know, the the other the other part of the powerlessness piece, I know from my perspective in my own journey, I felt powerless throughout my daughter's cancer yeah. journey and then following her transition from this world because I couldn't do anything to fix it. I couldn't do any I couldn't provide any any solutions when um, you know, that was my role as kind of like a problem solver. And I know for yeah. a lot of guys, we value our ability to, to solve stuff, yeah. to, to protect our families, to take care of our loved ones. And for me, when I couldn't do that, and when I saw the resulting impact it had on my, my sons and my wife in terms of their own grief, it just reminded me of what I failed, failed to do as her father was failed to protect. And that made me even all the more powerless. Yeah. And I think for a lot of guys and a lot of caretakers in general, I think that that feeling is quite common. Yeah. And I, I, there's so much you said about the lack of control just creates this, but just this intense depression and sadness because there's nothing you can do, you know, and, and, and you can, yeah, you can, I'm a believer in putting all the positive energy in the world that you possibly can. But to a certain degree, you have to, you have to let go of that control. And that's something that I learned to that situation. Um, very quickly, um, not in a, not a comfortable way by any means, but I had to at that point. Yeah. And letting go, I think is the ultimate form of trust in the universe or the divine that things are going to work out the way they're intended to work out. So Ashley, for you going through this, what in, and I, I have to say, just backtracking, I was smiling you know, at your, the, your type A personality. Um, how that triggered in, in terms of, we got to cancel the oil change. Cause I'm thinking <laughs> if that were me, I'd probably be thinking the same thing because <laughs> that'd be the first thing in my head. Well, geez, I got to cancel class. 
or geez, right. I, we got to cancel going to my son's house in Oswego. That, that'd be the first thing that would come into my head because that's how I'm wired. As small business owners, like we're, we're at the hospital in Utica and it's like, what time? Three, four, did we start getting calls? Yeah, not... Three, four, and we're like, you're supposed to be to work by 6 a.m. You have yep. patients <laughs> at 6 a.m. We need to start, both of us, we're supposed to start treating patients at six. So we're in the hospital. I'm in pain going, you can Facebook message someone said, oh, they're really good about responding. Thank you. Like, and we're like trying to team up to look at our calendars as I'm like literally dying to cancel our appointments because God forbid somebody show up to the office and we're not there. And again, that's for me as a small business owner, you understand like that value, I guess, of like letting your clients know if you're there, if you're not there. And that's why I respect so much like canceling the oil change because I didn't want them to like have another slot open that they could have done somebody else's oil change mm -hmm. and not, you know, it affected, mm -hmm. you know, their income, their business and their availability. So it's just type A brain, I guess. <laughs> well, and also compartmentalization, you know, the, the one side of your brain's thinking, I, I, I could literally die from what's going, what's happening to me. And the other part's thinking of what you have to do. Okay. But it's, it's, it's some way compartmentalization is kind of a survival mechanism in that, in that aspect. But also that, that's where our brains are going to go automatically because we're all busy. You know, I mean, somebody will ask me, how you doing? I'll say, I'm busier than a cat covering crap, crap on concrete. Which if, <laughs> if you've ever seen a cat cover crap on concrete, they're busy. <laughs> you know, they're, they're busy. And, oh. and, but, but that's normally, again, where our brains are going to go in terms of what we have to do and what we have to cancel, regardless of what's going on with us physically. But Ashley, for you, what were your thoughts and feelings as you were going through this? What and, and during it and then after as you had an opportunity to reflect? During it, it's very matter of fact. Like you know something's wrong, you can't fix it, it's out of your control. Do what you have to do is essentially like what my mindset was going into the surgery. Like I remember that being my mindset in Albany was okay, we're here. You're telling me this is what you have to do. Let's just get it done and like, let's go. Let's start this thing. Um, post, post-surgery, post knowing, you know, we were all okay. For me, it was very much just focused on, I'm not done. Like, like to me, I still, I'd hit a plateau in the journey of the pregnancy and I had that next hill to climb. Mm -hmm. So. For me, because I, I had somebody say this to me once was, um, how did you not just stop and just give up? And I, I was really confused by that, that mindset and that thought and that question, because in my mind, that's just not how I operate. There's never a, this happened to me and now I'm going to crumble. It's this happened to me and what am I going to do to rebuild? Um, and so that was my mindset is okay, I have a five pound weight limit. I have 2.5 pound plates in the garage. Those are what I'm going to use. And I would be out there just curling and pressing, curling and pressing, doing external shoulder rotation, like doing what I could and meeting myself where I was versus comparing myself and being like, oh, you know, last week I could do a, a, a 190 pound deadlift or you know, whatever it was. And it was, it was more just focus on moving forward. That happened. I'll deal with it because I wasn't ready to deal with it. I wasn't emotionally ready to review it, emotionally ready to deal with the PTSD of it all. Um, because again, my mind, I wasn't done. So I thought after I have the baby, I'll revisit all my feelings. I'll revisit all of the stuff and deal with it then right now I just have to focus on getting healthy and getting strong and you know postpartum I did not have as much time as I thought I was going to because now I'm a mom and you know I we were blessed with a child that didn't sleep but <laughs> the so you know and, and I chose to nurse so I would be up nursing him 10 times a night oh um, and he did not sleep during the day so all day long all night long I was up with him and I was exhausted and my brain could not process anything. Um, so I eventually 
didn't decide to get help with that. And I worked with um, a therapist who was fantastic. And we did some EMDR therapy. And that was incredibly helpful in helping me move forward and process and not have the the emotional fear and response to thoughts and images that I had prior. Like for me, the the image I descri- that Nick and I have described of how Nick found me after my first surgery, I do still have that picture. And, you know, there were times I was like scrolling through my phone looking for something and that picture would pop up and I would just break down and cry. And it was, it's hard to see yourself in that extreme state of you know you're so vulnerable here you're not in control um you're the weakest you've ever been you literally have tubes everywhere you're cut open and then there's that emotional response for me too because I also have empath tendencies of this is how my husband and my mom found me they didn't know that I was going to look like this I wasn't covered with a sheet to make it soft for them um and so I would cry for myself when I saw it but I would also cry for them um and so for me working through even just how I looked at that girl looked at me in that picture um and changed the narrative through EMDR of you know what the outcome was and you know how strong this girl was and how capable she is and how powerful her body was to be able to save her and her baby um that's that's helped me come forward and you know, having that ability to kind of flip the brain that way, it helps continue to go over the obstacles versus let them stop you in your tracks. Well, I think particularly for the both of you, the emphasis that you place on mind-body health, I think had to be an asset to you during the most challenging times of both of your lives. If you were not in the, the best, the great best physical shape that you were and put a premium on that, but also put a premium on that mind body connection, we may not be having this conversation. Well, it's very interesting. So, and, and so when she talked about how she recovered physically versus mentally and whatnot, when I was in, when she was still in in between surgeries and intubated and communicating on her whiteboard and doing those kind of things, the surgeon would make his rounds. And I remember he came in and uh, he was explaining things to her and she was a little more coherent at this point in time, could actually like I think she could understand a little more what had happened and she had her whiteboard and she grabbed the whiteboard and she wrote down that she flipped it around and showed him and said, I think I said, well, when should I start pelvic floor physical therapy is what it says. And, uh, you know, we didn't even know if she was going to make it or the baby's going to make it or anything like that yet. And the surgeon kind of looked at me and he smiled a little bit. He goes, let's just pump our brakes for a second here. We'll get to that in a couple hours probably, you know? So her mind was already laser focused on like the physical outcome of it and how she was going to be able to maintain her strengths. And, and, uh, you know, I've, uh, it's, it's interesting. I've actually had the chance to talk about this publicly many times since this has happened. And I've, I, you know, Dave, you and I have talked about this personally. Mm -hmm. I've talked to a lot of people personally about this and told the whole story a thousand times. This is her first chance really telling it too, you know? So like just, just this experience for her right now to be able to tell the story is very unique. It's very, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a good step in the right direction. Cause I think that healing journey happens forever. Cause I know every time I've told the story, it's meant something different to me. Um, and the repetition and, and I've gotten more, you know, uh, okay with it and all of that kind of stuff. So being able to, to just describe the, the emotions and the trauma and just say what you were feeling. It's important. Um, and it's, it's, we talked about controlling outcomes a little bit ago, you know, and one thing I think Ashley discredits is how strong she truly is. And, and I mean, specifically physically, um, what she does with her practice is she teaches postpartum and prenatal core rehabilitation exercises. So she literally is, is a professional core strength and for lack of better mm-hmm. words, you know, and in between surgery, the surgeon and I sat there and we had, we had many long discussions and conversations and he, saw, he looked at me and he goes, what does that girl do in the gym? And I, I explained what she does for her work and whatnot. And he goes, her core is so good. And he made <laughs> And he talked about like the actually like sawing through the layers of abdominal uh-huh. musculature and how that actually controlled the outcome proactively, you know? So, uh, uh-huh. I've found so much like even at that moment of time, like ruminating on that, like, like it was almost this like divine intervention thing that she had been training in this mechanism for so long and getting so strong and whatnot. 
And that prophylactically is what got her through this theoretically, you know, or at least was a huge component of her outcomes. It's amazing, man. So I think that even when we talk about controlling outcomes that are in a, in a time where there's, there's feels like a lack of control, well, it's all the work you put in 10 years prior, you know? So it's really just incredible. We're, n- we're not able to control our futures in, in some regards, um, where, you know, I, I didn't know that this was going to happen. Um, but we all are going to age and we all are going to, you know, have different things that we face throughout our life. And the best case scenario is to go into your life with strength and being physically and mentally strong. Because, you know, for me, I lost, I went into this very, very strong physically. Um, and I had taken a shift in my in my style of training, when we decided we were going to no longer prevent a pregnancy from happening. And, you know, I, I stopped, you know, doing CrossFit in such intensity and I focused mostly on core and strength and pelvic stability and, um, you know, all of that, again, like Nick kind of said that, that, that saved me, but I lost 14 pounds in 10 days. Um, so if I didn't have that muscle mass for my body to pull from, again, the outcome and my current health could be very, very different. Um, you know, in the hospital, I was able to reposition myself. I could still lift myself into a bridge. I could pull up on the bed to, you know, pull myself to reposition myself where, you know, once I was strong enough where I was able to, you know, do short walks in the hallway, you know, getting I think two doors down was like where I started before, you know, and you'd get a couple each day a little bit further. But you look as you're walking and you see the other people on the floors and you see the different age ranges and you see the different physical outcomes of whatever happened to them. And some of the positions you would see people laying in, it was it was just heartbreaking because you're like, they need help. Like they're not comfortable. They're like, and I was a capable person and I couldn't do things for myself. And, you know, it was Memorial weekend when we were in the hospital originally. And, you know, the, the, once I had left ICU, I went onto the floor, main floor and, you know, they were very short staffed. Like nobody could come when you needed them. If you like had to go to the bathroom or, you know, if you needed to be repositioned and, um, being strong enough to do that for myself helped me. And so I've always been an advocate for strength. And after this experience, it's just magnified. You, I can't tell people enough to focus on their health and strength because you're responsible for yourself and you need to be the one to make yourself uncomfortable and lift the weights and walk away from, you know, the Oreos or whatever you know, you're, you're, uh, um, pulled towards and it's okay to make those hard decisions and you're not going to always be comfortable, but you have to know that in the end, you're doing the right thing for your body and your mind. Yeah, those are all great points, great observations. But the other thing that I heard from talking about your experience is that you, your innate will to survive kicked in almost immediately. And I know I was kidding you, I was kidding you earlier about you know, about the type A personality piece, how we would align with that in terms of thinking about the task oriented stuff we would need to cancel. But at the same time, for me, that's your brain going into survival mode. It's saying, look, I'm not ready to check out of this existence yet. I want to continue to live. And okay. if that means thinking of the things I got to do and got to cancel, that's going to get me in survival mode. That's going to put me in that survival mode. And I tell individuals who have, I, who have gone through catastrophic loss or life altering challenges don't underestimate your innate will innate ability to want to survive because that's going to get you to begin to thrive re-engage in life re-engage in life with purpose and learn that you know life shouldn't be taken for granted we're only guaranteed the day that we have in front of us absolutely so for both of you yeah um, no i go ahead no i i'm I'm good. I'm you know, the, the floor is yours. Well, I was going to say, just speaking to that for, for like, you know, um, to the control aspect of things. I, Dave, I've told you this before too, but like, I don't know anybody 
who takes their health as seriously as Ashley does, you know, and that's from every component. And, and we laughed about this when we told Davis the first time, we just took just a couple of days prior to all this happening. I remember we were doing something, we were at her parents' house and somebody had a can of just seltzer water, like just from the grocery store. And, um, someone offered Ashley one and she, she declined the seltzer water. And I said, why? Just the, you know, just curiosity. And she said, cause the can doesn't say it's BPA free. And um, I, I, I don't there even remember. And I thought to myself, I didn't even know cans had BPA in them, you know? And she went on to show me the can, how it doesn't say BPA free and how whatever, you know? And then uh, I thought about that. I was on a very big BPA trip <laughs> because I was pregnant <laughs> and I read Emily Nichols. Um, what is it? Uh, Expecting better. No, not that one. Mm. The nutrition one. Um, um, Real nutrition for pregnancy. Um, and it was very anti, you know, certain things. I was like, oh, I cannot punch the receipts at the office anymore, Nick. Those have BPA. <laughs> so then I'm sitting there in the hospital and I thought about that because I thought about the fact that this is the girl that turned down the canned water because there's BPA in it. She's that healthy. And here she almost acutely died in a stretch of 44 minutes. I was know? trying to protect the baby. Unreal. <laughs> and, and that's why she's the... True CEO of Clive Chiropractic exactly. because, because of those things. Uh, That's why she has a 51% majority of stock. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You I, know what I mean? I had two seltzer waters that day, David. That's right. <laughs> hey, just remember, if you don't, you're drinking non-BPA seltzer water, she could buy you out in a heartbeat. <laughs> oh, fuck. That's really funny. Oh. Uh, well, Nick, keep, Nick keeps me around for my sense of humor. It's not for any, yeah, yeah. any other reason. So, but, yeah. Yeah. um, God, this has been a fun conversation so far. Uh -huh. I mean, really enlightening, but we're getting close to our time. So I want to ask you a couple of other questions. You've given us some great takeaways you. from your journey, but if there's a one or two more additional takeaways you want to leave our, our audience with. And as a result of your experience, what would that be that can help them navigate through their own life challenges? You go first. Um, well, you know, I still, I always go back to, you know, the control aspect of things is a big one. Um, since then I have preached to everybody, uh, you gotta be proactive versus reactive. And I think that's physically, mentally, emotionally, um, all of those things that like you have to be prepared for what's going to come knocking at your door because something's going to come knocking at your door. You know, mm -hmm. uh, we don't get to choose what it is either. We don't get to pick that. We have no control over that, but you can control how you respond to that thing. And that thing could be disease. It could be trauma. It could be anything physically, mentally, financially, all that stuff. You know, the, there's so much to be said about how we have changed in a world away from proactivity. We, we, we react to everything. We react re vehemently and usually our reactions are, are angry. But if we were more proactive and prepared prior, that would probably be a different reaction because we would have some sort of sense of control then on the back end of it. So I, I, I preach out to every single person I talk to at the office or any of my remote clients or anybody I work with that you have to get yourself ready. Cause you don't know, you don't, you don't know what life is going to bring you. So the preparation is important. Uh, I mean, it's cliche, it's cheesy, but eat. love your loved ones. You know, you have to like, really, you don't know if when your loved ones are going to be here, when they're not going to be here. In one instance, I was a uh, expecting father with a beautiful 19 week pregnant wife, uh, you know, and, and, uh, and a business that was thriving and, and doing well and happy and healthy. And 44 minutes later, I was almost say, widower who was not going to be a father any longer and was taken away from everything that I thought my life was going to be and all that kind of stuff. So don't take it for granted because it's easy to, and I know I did. I know I definitely took it for granted. I focused on the wrong things. I worked too hard. I, uh, you know, stressed too much probably. And, and, you know, you have to really, really understand what's important to you. When we were talking about that privately, I went back to my own journey of loss and, and I, I could. I could resonate with that mm -hmm. you know, because life can turn on a dime. And I also felt, was thinking how grateful I was that you guys didn't have the same outcome, that you had lost yeah. Ashley or had lost Charlie. Um, I was just so glad because, I mean, for me, you're two of the greatest people on the planet <laughs> and, for, and, for, and for for things to have turned out the way they, they turned out, it's just, Hey, Ashley's got a, you and Ashley got a lot more work to do. And that son of yours has got a mission, 
in this life that is going to be impactful and what you guys are going to continue to do is going to be impactful. So that's why I've always loved what you do with something like this, because now actually we can step back and now we have a chance to teach these things, you know, um, by going through, if we never went through this, we couldn't teach about this, you know, we couldn't teach about how to respond for things and everything. We just spoke on there about how to treat your loved ones and everything, because I would probably still be taking things for granted. So there is never, I would never describe the situation as a good thing by any means, but it doesn't mean you can't pull good from good outcomes from bad things, you know, so you can pull good from it and learn from it and take that into the world. But I think it's made me a more well-rounded person and I've been able to, you know, express emotion way better and understand how to communicate it and everything. So there's so much there. So now I hope that I can teach someone who is going to go through trauma someday get ready for it now because it's it's going to happen and you have to be able to hold yourself accountable during that point in time and that comes with practice just like anything else exactly ashley what about you is there anything you want to add to what nick said i mean everything he said i completely agree with and it's what i would have said as well just worded differently um i the big part is i think a lot of people don't say what they want to say to the people around them. Um, I think we think it, but we don't say it. And yes, we all know that family and that friends that we love each other, but I think it's not said enough. And so I find myself more expressive about those types of things where, you know, I'll send like a group chat to like my whole family, like, you know, saying, hey, everybody, like, I love you. I'm thinking of you today. Like, and it, you don't even have to have a reason why, but sometimes it does help to have a reason why, mm -hmm. Um, you know, so just express yourself more. And even, you know, even with your spouse, like, yes, you love each other, but there is that day to day grind. And I think sometimes as you're walking by your spouse, do you put your hand on their shoulder just, you know, just to have physical touch as you're walking by? Do you stop to take 10 seconds out of your day to give them a hug? Do you, you know, it's not going to slow you down. You will still get your tasks done. But I think that it's really, really, really important to slow down and really love the people that are in your life because you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow or later today, you know, so express your love, express your gratitude and show it, you know, give hugs, give kisses, high fives, whatever you want to do. Um, I think that that's really important. I think from a mental standpoint, I think how Nick kind of talked about, um, this popped in my head. So this is going to be kind of broken. So I can't remember what you said that triggered this thought, but it was, a <laughs> um, is, you know, if you are, Feeling resistance to something happening in your life, sometimes it helps to pause and break that down. Um, you know, are you having conflict with somebody? Are you having fear of a situation happening? I think if you stop and actually think about what in that situation is really going on, sometimes it helps you learn a little bit more about yourself and that other person where you can kind of break down some of your barriers. So Say, say you have a coworker that really bothers you and you're like, oh my gosh, every time this person talks in a meeting, like I just want it to end. Pause and ask yourself why, why, why does that person talking bother you so much? And maybe it's, they have a characteristic trait that you have, but don't let yourself express. Um, you know, so there's, there's different things where if you really pause, break things down, think things through, you can help learn a little bit about yourself. And then from there, you can kind of break through and become a little lighter. Um, and then maybe I'll be able to express gratitude towards that coworker. <laughs> um, I think that's kind of a little bit of a ramble there for you, Dave, but that's where my brain went. It's not a ramble at all because I think Nick and I have talked about this in terms of even the people in our lives that we deem as the least desirable people we want in our lives have something to teach us if we allow yeah. them to do that. Yeah. And in that way, their teachings to us become a gift to us because it awakens Very parts, well. yeah, it awakens parts of ourselves that we were once dormant that we weren't aware of. And once we were aware of those parts and we could integrate those parts into who we are, we become more genuine and whole. So I think everything is in service to us. Well said, Dave. Very well said.
Thank you. Um, and this is giving you an opportunity to do a little self-promotion. How people want to find, find you, find out more about your services, get in touch with you. What's the best way to do that? Um, we have our Instagram. So my business Instagram is at seven feet stronger. Um, we have our climb Cairo Utica on Instagram as well. Um, I know I'm personally best with email. <laughs> so you can feel free to link my email in there, but it's a moody at climb Cairo sports health.com. But there's our website as well. Yeah. That we have uh, our website, climb Cairo sports health.com has all of our contact information. Yeah. Any of the, any of the programs that we, we work with and do and all that, you can find us all on there. That's the most, I mean, in the technological world. On there, that's where we're the most active, probably. My um, old school email ways. And, actually, uh, I, <laughs> and on the same, like I said, we haven't shared this whole story publicly at all yet, other than this forum right now. Um, Ashley's Instagram account is active in her recovery a little bit, though. So there is some, you know, some of the pictures from and, and the videos of her trying to walk the hospital are active on there. So I heard seven feet stronger Instagram. You can find it. it's the number seven. Uh, we created that line for her because the seven feet of intestines that she lost and how she became stronger because of that. So it's kind of a fun little play on words, but there's been some of the journey shared there too. I think that's a great way to honor that, honor your journey, both of your journeys. And for me, I really appreciate the trust to allow me, allow me the space to create for you guys to share your story. That means a lot to me. Um, I, I am always inspired by everybody's stories. They're a gift to me and mm -hmm. continue to inspire me. And I, I figure if somebody is entrusting me with their story, they feel safe enough and they deem me as trustworthy enough to honor it the way it should be honored. So I appreciate both of you taking the time out of your day um, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. to do that with me. And this is a big step in what we just talked about with teaching too, about how this is the, you know, being the first public actually time telling the story is going to teach someone hopefully so giving us the platform to do that on dave we're really appreciative of it. so thank you and you can have this platform anytime you want you careful what you wish for he wants to start a podcast so get ready but <laughs> you might cool. have to go soon <laughs> that that sounds good to me <laughs> that sounds good to me in dave <laughs> here we go We'll, 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 we'll bust the internet with that one. Nick. Yeah, right. With that, Nick, Nick and Ashley, it has just been a great experience. Thank you so much for today. Thank you, Thank Dave. You. We appreciate, we appreciate so much. it so much. Thank you. My pleasure. And with that, that's a wrap on another episode of the Teaching Journeys podcast. I'm your host, Dave Roberts, wishing you peace.